Welcome to, to, to today's masterclass at the Good Intelligent Digital Trust World 2021. My name is Alan Good, CEO and Chief Analyst at Good Intelligence, and I shall be your host for today's masterclass. We are bringing you a masterclass every day to align with today's theme. Today's theme is fraud and security, and the masterclass is in partnership with CIFAS, UK's fraud prevention community. I'm joined by Nicole Gibbs, Member Relationship Manager, and Neil Jordan, Membership Relationship Manager from CIFAS. We will talk to you about their work and guide you through how the community is dealing with the challenges of managing fraud across, across a wide range of companies and sectors. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Alan. So here at CIFAS, our mission is to lead the fight against fraud by sharing data, intelligence and learning. We are the UK's fraud prevention community and we bring together a vast network of organisations and people with a stake in fraud prevention. Our membership is as diverse as our information. We currently have over 600 organisations within membership, some of whom's logos you can see on the slide in front of you now. We deliver trusted data of unparalleled depth and diversity, hosting the largest databases of fraud risk in the UK. Our databases are the most comprehensive and diverse sources of fraud risk in the country. We also share intelligence, dynamic intelligence, to understand the fraud threat landscape now and in the future. We offer cutting edge fraud prevention tools to inform the threat picture and protect our community. We also provide accredited education and trusted training for organisations and individuals. We share our knowledge and our expertise with our community to help combat fraud. We work on the principle of having three pillars to fight fraud, data, intelligence and learning. Our data is the largest fraud risk databases in the UK. We have the only database to monitor the insider threat, the internal fraud database. We have many innovative tools and features. We have a single point of sign on and access is available 24 seven. We also have some unique and exclusive additional data sets. In terms of intelligence, we provide daily intelligence briefings, an annual strategic intelligence assessment. We have a network of thousands of professionals and our portal is the digital gateway to those professionals talking amongst themselves within the CIFAS community. We also identify trends and threats and we do this by expert analysis. CIFAS Learning provides accredited education in fraud prevention and investigation. We provide trusted training for specialist skills and knowledge, and we offer off -qual regulated qualifications. We also offer some postgraduate study with a leading university, and we have expert tutors and leading academics. All of these three core pillars support our fraud prevention community. Collaboration connects us here at CIFAS, where we will always be there to seek out and stop fraud. When you join CIFAS, you join the most effective defence against fraud in the UK. For 30 years, the success of CIFAS has been underpinned by our trusted legal and secure databases, delivered via a real-time technology platform and innovative tools, and it's supported by strong information governance. Our fraud prevention community collectively saves over one billion pounds in prevented fraud losses every single year. How CIFAS works. Our members have the ability to search our national fraud database. If any of the information that they search matches against any information held on the CIFAS database at present, then a CIFAS case or cases, if there are multiple matches, are returned to the member in order for them to investigate. By doing this, it helps the member prevent and identify fraud. CIFAS is a reciprocal database. 
Therefore, we would ask that when our members identify cases of high fraud risk themselves, that they too file those cases to the National Fraud Database to be shared with the rest of the membership. In order for a case to be filed to CIFAS, it has to have been confirmed as high fraud risk. There needs to be sufficient evidence to prove this, and there's a standard of proof outlined in our handbook, which we ask all our members to read and abide by, that must be reached. It is also imperative that individuals and businesses being filed to the CIFAS database have been notified about how their personal data is going to be used. I'm just going to play a short video for you now, explaining a little bit more about what we do. Almost one in every two crimes in the UK is a fraud or cybercrime. Fraudsters steal and use identities, launder money, steal customer data, and lie for financial gain. Often they are expert collaborators. They don't compete with each other, they work together. To protect businesses and individuals from fraud, we too must work together. We cannot compete. Working with CIFAS, hundreds of organizations have been bold enough to leave competition at the door and to share data and information on fraud with other CIFAS members. These organizations come from different sectors, are many different sizes, and have different customer or user needs. But they have one thing in common, the belief that you cannot fight fraud on your own. Between them, CIFAS members record an average of one fraud every two minutes. Using trusted, secure, real-time data sharing technology, these organizations prevented £1 billion in attempted fraud against their businesses, staff and customers. They shared hundreds of thousands of fraud cases and protected the identities of individuals across the UK, including some of the most vulnerable in our society. Between them, they shared alerts and intelligence and reported 850 cases a day through CIFAS systems to police for investigation. Their data was used to inform government policy and to shape debate on fraud and financial crime. Our community achieves a lot through collaboration. Isn't it time your organization joined in? The eagle-eyed among you will have noticed in that video that it spoke of 400 CIFAS members. The video itself was actually made a couple of years ago and we now have over 600 CIFAS members. As the video mentioned, these are from a wide range of sectors, including public sector members such as local authority and Royal Mail, among many others, and private sector members um, from financial services, peer-to-peer um, -peer lenders, alternative lenders, business lenders, uh, asset finance lenders, motor finance lenders and insurance, among others. We also have some charities within membership, so we also cover third sector as well. When it comes to filing to the National Fraud Database, these are the case types that you can file for. We have asset conversion, which is the unlawful sale of an asset subject to a credit agreement. For example, a car bought on finance and sold on before it has been paid off. False insurance claim, which occurs when an insurance claim or supporting documentation contains material falsehoods. Identity fraud, when a subject abuses personal data to impersonate an innocent party or creates a fictitious identity to open a new account or obtain a product. False application, when an application for a product or service is made with material falsehoods, often using false supporting documentation. Facility takeover, when a subject abuses personal data to hijack an existing account or product, for example, a bank account or a mobile phone contract. Misuse of facility, the misuse of an account policy or product, for example, allowing criminal funds to pass through an account or paying in an altered cheque. As well as those case types, which are filed by our members to the National Fraud Database, we also host some trusted third-party data. This is information which identifies that a risk of fraud has been provided in respect of a subject by one of our trusted third-party providers, such as Royal Mail, who provide us with cancelled fraudulent redirections and keep safe records, 
the General Registrar's Office who provide us with disease data. We receive law enforcement alerts from the police. We also receive scans data from Traded Standards Scotland and the British Oil Security Syndicate. These cases match in the same way as the other case types I've just mentioned, which are filed by our members. All CIFAS users are set up with an individual username and password in order to be able to access the CIFAS portal. Within the CIFAS portal, there is a forum which allows um, members to discuss industry trends and news with other CIFAS members. Intelligence, on which CIFAS put out their threats, their be aware alerts, and a wide range of intelligence resources for members to be able to log in and use at any time. Investigation hosts FIND, which is the front end system used to search and file cases to the CIFAS databases. It also provides um, our membership registers, um, which is where you can find details of how to contact and talk to other members about cases they may have filed, should you need to have a conversation with them to find out additional information. There's also a help section where you can find the CIFAS handbooks and also receive assistance with the CIFAS portal and guidance. You can also find full information on there about CIFAS learning and all the training courses that we offer, as well as the many events we host throughout the year. And it's our main way of talking to our members by providing any CIFAS updates. Next, I'm going to talk about a few of the additional tools that you can get through the National Fraud Database. First of all, there's location-based alerts. When a search is undertaken, FIND obtains the geographical coordinates of the current or delivery address that is being searched. Those coordinates are used to establish a search area. And the FIND database will then check if any identity frauds or facility takeover frauds have been recorded within that search area. If the number and age of the frauds in the area are within specific thresholds, there is a default setting of four cases in a 100 metre radius within 60 days, but that can be altered by our members if they wish to search wider. Then a member will be shown a location-based alert. The alert contains the case type, product code and filing reasons of each National Fraud Database case which is contributed to the alert. For legal reasons, there is not possible to provide more information about these cases. Next, we have Enhanced Analytics, which is used to analyse search data in real time to identify patterns that suggest your application or request may be an identity fraud. When a search is undertaken, FIND analyses the search criteria by comparing it to every other recent search from across the membership. The analytics engine identifies where multiple searches have been made with a common element of data alongside multiple different identities. That data element is typically something like an email address, a bank account or a mobile phone number. If Enhanced Analytics identifies this activity, FIND will alert you as part of the search result and highlight the common data element. Next, we have CaseLink. CaseLink ensures that you gain the maximum benefit from the wealth of data held on the National Fraud Database by showing you wider connections between cases. It works by taking cases matched as part of any type of search and then displaying what other cases those matched cases are linked to. It is particularly powerful when searches are originally performed using limited criteria. And it does this automatically in real time without the need for members to link cases manually when filing cases to the database. We now also have facial matching software within the National Fraud Database. Cases within the National Fraud Database may include images of documents which include a photograph such as a passport or a driving licence. Facial matching allows you to search an image of a subject against these documents and it's also used in case link making it possible for you to identify cases which are linked by having the same face in a document. All documents filed to CIFAS um, have to have been um, confirmed as false, altered or fraudulently obtained genuine so you would not be able to um, match to um, the genuine document.
We also provide each of our members with their very own dashboards, which provides real time statistics for their organisation and is only visible to their organisation. They can adjust the time period on the dashboard and it can be really useful in providing data for their own internal reports. We also have some proactive alerts. Proactive alert reports are a suite of actionable intelligent reports in FIND that help give our members earlier warning about threats to their business. The alerts currently available are bank account alerts, which is where members would provide a list of sort codes that they want to be included in the nightly analysis. And if any of these are a match to a new filing, then an alert is generated and a report is available for them to view in FIND. If there's a match to a new filing, then all historic matches for that filing are displayed in the report and the daily reports are held for 30 days. We have an email domain proactive alert, which is where you can create an alert with your business or employment email domain um, so that if a new case is added to the National Fraud Database with that email domain, you'll be alerted, allowing you to investigate. Our victim challenge alert is where a member receives an alert if they have filed an innocent party, a victim of identity fraud, to the National Fraud Database. And another member has filed the same individual, but instead of filing it as an innocent party, they've been filed for fraudulent conduct. This alert is reverse functionality to the innocent party audit report, which is another proactive alert available to our members. This report lists cases filed in the last 13 months containing subjects filed for first party fraud who have since been filed by another member as a victim of fraud. And finally, we have our fill value alert. To ensure that accurate data is held and to reduce false positive matches, the fill value alerts monitor and identify incorrect data filed, allowing members to review and correct any data inconsistencies. If a report of this type is generated, then it's a mandatory requirement to complete any of the reports um, for your organisation within seven days, and this is to ensure data accuracy. So I've spoken a little bit about the National Fraud Database, which is used for screening consumers or applicants for services or products at your organisation. I'm now going to hand over Neil, to Neil, who's going to talk about our internal fraud database, which is used to screen staff or applicants for employment. And they are the two databases that SIFAS host. Over to you, Neil. Thanks, Nicole. So I'm going to start with a focus on our offering as it relates to internal fraud. Fraud committed during the life cycle of an individual's employment so including the actual application for employment. On the application side, you will see on the right hand side of this slide that we distinguish between a successful false employment application, essentially where the individual is already sitting at one of your desks and an unsuccessful false employment application where they never got to sit at that desk and did not have the opportunity to commit any of the other internal fraud types that we're going to talk about shortly. We define a false application as one which contains serious material falsehoods. For example, not disclosing or attempting to hide criminal convictions that are asked for in the application or lying about previous roles or qualifications to bolster your experience or maybe even hiding your real identity. These material falsehoods may also be backed up in the presentation of false or forged documentation, which try to give credence to your false claims. Clearly, we and our members would prefer that all false employment applications are unsuccessful, but there are times when maybe the role being recruited needed to be filled quickly and checks were being completed while the applicant was being trained into the role. Or there may be things which come to light at a later date. Maybe a new starter forgets they had added a degree, a degree to their CV and lets slip to their manager that they only spent one year at university. Obviously, we would always encourage full checks to be made before placing an applicant in a role. I've also included some of the other EIFD case types on this slide. So we have account misconduct, so an authorised activity on a customer account, for example, transferring money out of the customer account without the customer's approval. Uh, we also have being bribed, 
receiving or even just agreeing to receive some advantage for performing uh, an improper action. Probably one of our main recordings on the IFD is a dishonest action in order to obtain a benefit by theft or deception. This is a very wide ranging type covering things such as submitting false expenses, false overtime or time sheets, perpetrating or facilitating false insurance claims, and also theft of stock, cash or office equipment amongst any other, many other reasons for filing. We also include unlawful obtaining or disclosure of data relating to either commercial data so perhaps intellectual property, internal policies, processes, practices, or contravening policies relating to business email, internet or systems access policies. Also the, dis the disclosure of personal data, so perhaps using yourself or disclosing to a third party customer data that you are only privileged to see or have come to see via your employment. So on this slide, I just wanted to try to bring the value of the internal fraud database to life a little for you. This is a busy slide, which I apologize for, but I hope it gives a good example of how fraud committed in one employment can stay with you over time, even if you try to conceal it when applying to work for any of our members. The sequence in front of you is based on a true scenario, but obviously we're not using our subjects real or alias names. So let's call him, or at least to start with, we'll call him John Smith. Now the genuine John Smith was employed with a CIFAS member, member one at the top here. He was provided with a fair processing notice at the relevant point or points of his employment with that member, but he still chose to commit a dishonest action to obtain a benefit by theft or deception in stealing from one of the member's customers. Following an investigation at that member, the member satisfied themselves that this was sufficient for them to dismiss the individual, to report him to the police, and for our purposes that the standard of proof they had was sufficient to file the information they held about him to the internal fraud database. Mr Smith then went on an application spree in an attempt to obtain new employment, but at each point he went to another CIFAS member organisation of which there were six in total and some more than once, as you can see along the top row. These members identified a fraud committed within the job application, either or both of dishonestly making a false misrepresentation and or dishonestly failing to disclose information. You can see that following the first filing, the same subject was declined for new employment eight times, protecting all of these members from a very real risk of fraud within their organizations. And not only that, as new fraud was found in the course of each application, it meant that the details were filed back into the database at each point and meant that the clock started again on the subject's time on our databases. Remember that the information remains available for our members to match against for six years in line with data protection requirements. You can see by the red text towards the top that the subject used different names, different date of births, national insurance numbers, um, on that, I know we have an international audience here, so I think social security number could be a near equivalent synonym for, the, for, for what we call in the UK national insurance numbers. Um, he also used different home and email addresses and telephone numbers. But at each point, our data matching rules allowed our members to identify it and prevent the subject from obtaining a role with them. You can also see from the bottom row, so I'm looking at CIFAS filing type here, that he had at times gone to the trouble of falsifying documents in an attempt to give credence to his identity, but still to no avail. I hope this is a useful example to start showing the value of our internal fraud database. So the previous example I showed you was um, regarding members matching only to filings on the internal fraud database when searching colleagues or potential colleague information. But we also now allow our internal fraud database members to match to certain filings on the national fraud database that Nicole has outlined to you just now. Those filings on the national fraud database with a clear first party aspect that employers may wish to be aware of, such as, amongst others, but most relevant for this example, 
misuse of facility and application fraud. So the, this, the applicant in this case to one of our members, the details of that applicant matched to two different filings on the National Fraud Database, which our member was satisfied were true matches to the applicant. This led to them carrying out some additional checks, checks they may not have made without this intelligence, which ultimately led to them identifying financial issues and prior convictions, including one for fraud. There is a chance that those frauds were at one time live on our database, but the job application came after they would have had to have been removed to comply with our data protection requirements. While the convictions were both spent, our member was able to deduce, to deduce that on her CV, she had declared being in employment at the time she was in fact serving a prison sentence. And on verifying with the supposed employer that she was not working for them at that time, they were able to file her to, the, to our internal fraud database for application fraud. Again, hopefully another powerful example of the value of our internal fraud database. So more generally across both databases, how do we ensure that our members can rely on the information we hold and also be confident that they are using our databases correctly? In this regard, we have a highly evolved and efficient compliance function which applies to all members across both databases. As you may imagine, data accuracy is essential to our model. and We monitor this via what we call e-reviews. Each member, fits into our review schedule and will be reviewed a number of times over the course of each year. The regularity can depend on a number of factors such as how many searches they complete and how many filings they make to our databases. We will also place more focus on compliance for specific members if there has been any recent issues identified internally, perhaps from previous e-reviews. We also find we can identify potential issues based on contacts we receive from consumers. There may be an issue if we were to receive a relative spike in complaints or data subject access requests relating to one of our members more than any others. In addition to this, we'll also complete periodic reviews of our members' fair processing notices. Things like are all applicants, customers and colleagues getting the right FPNs at the right times? And if that wasn't already enough, we will monitor our members' compliance with principles we run reports on various required aspects of membership in this regard, and the example given here is self-searching. As a user of CIFAS, I am not allowed to search my own information on the databases, and we will pick up on this if it happens. Obviously, we will provide the necessary and relevant information to individuals requesting what information we hold about them through a formal data subject access request, but we do not allow users to get over and above what they allowed by searching for themselves. Now I'm conscious that this sounds very serious and while I don't apologise for this necessarily as it is very important to us, to our members and to the general public, non-compliance is very, very much the exception and not the rule. So now I would like to give you an idea of the numbers we're seeing reported to us. We release an annual report, which we call Fraudscape. It's available to anyone with access to the internet at www.fraudscape.co.uk. And I would of course encourage you to seek it out. But for the moment, I'm going to summarize some of the statistics that we reported in there this year, and which relate to data reported to our databases in the calendar year of 2020. So in 2020, there were 310 thousand cases there or thereabouts of fraudulent conduct recorded on our databases. This equates to one case every two minutes, which is a staggering amount across our 600 or so members, and particularly in the context in which we've all been working over these last 18 months or so. In the first half of 2021, as things are hopefully returning to normal, or at least the new normal, we have even seen a 13% increase in cases filed to the NFD compared with the first half of 2020. 185,578 of the filings were cases of identity fraud. The identity fraud numbers for 2020 are in fact a 17% reduction on what our members recorded in 2019, 
although the pandemic has clearly played the major part in this reduction. Again, we've seen a year on year increase of 11% for identity fraud when we compare the first half of this year with the first half of last. You'll see in the bottom bubble that we are reporting an increase in the number of companies being impersonated in 2020 compared with the previous year. We believe the appearance of stimulus packages, stimulus package offerings aimed at supporting businesses through the pandemic has actually been an enabler in the increase in this area. Additional fraud relating to these stimulus packages that hasn't already been picked up may become evident as more and more of the lending becomes repayable over the period of time to come. Identity fraud and misuse of facility are our most common fraud types and together amount to 82% of all cases on the National Fraud Database. For misuse of facility, we have had close to 70,000 cases filed to the NFT in 2020, which, while again a reduction on 2019 filings, equates to over a quarter of all filings. And again, the first half of this year is showing an increase, this time of 23% on the first half of 2020. Bank accounts are the main product targeted for misuse of facility. Over three quarters of all misuse of facility cases are on bank accounts. And of these, over three quarters include intelligence indicating money mule activity. So just briefly, what is money muling? Essentially, a money mule is someone who transfers stolen money on behalf of others, and usually through their bank account. They're often recruited, and some think that this is their legitimate job. Where there is money mule activity, our intelligence suggests a high proportion of adults aged between 21 to 30 years old being involved. And this seems to fit the stereotypical notion that the individuals are naive and unwitting parties in what is effectively money laundering. The promise of apparently easy money is too hard to turn down, even though many must be more than suspicious about the legitimacy of what they're being asked to do. Our intelligence also suggests a lot of recruitment via social media channels and also at universities, again playing into the age ranges we predominantly see engaging in this behaviour. There is also more and more use of cryptocurrency in this area. So moving on to facility takeover now. This fraud type is one for which we have seen a rise through the pandemic. Comparing the first half of this year with the first half of 2020 also shows an uptick of 14%. Targeting existing accounts and obtaining sufficient knowledge through social engineering techniques such as phishing over email, vishing by voice over the telephone generally, and smishing via text messaging appears to have been a method of choice throughout the pandemic. Unsurprisingly, COVID-19 related malicious campaigns have been prevalent in the personal data harvesting techniques used by fraudsters to assist in a facility takeover. For example, encouraging individuals to apply and pay for false vaccinations or false tests. Social engineering techniques have often sought to latch on to major events of the time in order to help give a sense of legitimacy or urgency and to draw people in on an emotional level. After sufficient personal information is harvested via various means, our intelligence suggests a high proportion of takeovers then occurring via the telephony route of financial and other service providers. A person rather than technology perhaps perceived as an easier target to convince. And then finally, on the numbers full circle back to the internal fraud database on which we record, were recorded 290 individuals in 2020. Now, this was down on the 2019 number of 432. And again, it's clear the pandemic has limited recruitment. Also in many areas with a furlough scheme, it's tended to reduce the numbers of employed people actually working in their role during, during that period. On the flip side, however, it's meant a much higher number of individuals working from home, which in itself opens up new areas of fraud risk, which businesses may not have thought they needed to consider. We have worked with our members consistently to highlight potential areas to focus. 44 
50% of the internal fraud cases filed in 2020 were for dishonest actions, which is also the highest reported case type in 2019. Interestingly, we've seen a 43% rise in cases recorded for unlawful obtaining or disclosure of personal data, which has perhaps become more exposed and in less controlled environments with the shift to home working. SIFAS has a wealth of information on our website, www.sifas.org.uk, and this is available to everyone. A recent example is highlighted here, where we've released a blog talking about an opportunity to commit fraud, which we probably could not have foreseen, certainly 18 months ago, and maybe not even six months ago. Some businesses may require their colleagues to prove they've been vaccinated before they are permitted to return to the office. There could be various reasons for this, and it would have to be sufficiently worded so as to excuse those with particular, perhaps medical reasons for not being vaccinated, and so as not to discriminate. If I was outside of these exclusions and not vaccinated, it could open up a fraud instance to obtain a fake proof document. And on this, there were reports only in May of over 1,200 companies worldwide offering fake COVID-19 vaccination and test certificates. And you have to think that will increase if they are required for more and more of our day-to-day -day interactions going forward, including in our employment. So I hope that myself and Nicole have gone some way to introducing you to what we, and crucially our members do here at SIFAS. Our community continues to grow, and maybe it is something you and your business could contribute to and benefit from. We have the UK's largest databases of fraud risk data and intelligence. We offer accredited education and trusted training. You'll be able to share knowledge and expertise with thousands of like-minded professionals and experts, as well as collaborating with organisations across many varied sectors to fight fraud and protect the United Kingdom. As before, you can find us at www.cyfest.org.uk and we would love to hear from you. Thank you. That was a really great introduction to the work of uh, CIFAS and your community. Listening to your talk has thrown up a number of questions that I hope you can answer for me. So Neil, Nicole, if you can come back in to the forum, um, we've, we've, got a, we've got a number of questions that, uh, that hopefully you can, you can answer for me. So first question, and I saw from you know, the end of Neil's presentation, his discussion that, uh, you know, that there is COVID-19 has had an impact on, on, on fraud levels and types of fraud. So let's have a look at, you know, what has been the impact from COVID-19 from, from CIFAS's point of view on fraud uh, levels, targets and types as a result of COVID. Thank you. Sure. So um, COVID COVID definitely led to an increase in fraud and scams. Um, we discussed it. Maybe our figures don't reflect that um, as, as businesses have had to um, work to be able to report frauds to us and to identify frauds in a different world. Um, but yeah, we, we would suggest there's definitely a, an increase in fraud and scams targeting both consumers and businesses. Um, the Office of National Statistics figures suggest 4.6 million fraud offences in the financial year ending March 2021. Um, that's a 24% increase and largely fueled by a 28% increase in reports to action fraud, the UK's National Fraud Reporting Centre. Um, we've, as I've, as I've sort of alluded to, we, we've seen cases drop by 7% um, as members have adapted to the pandemic. Um, a lot of our members had to restrict new business and new products and this this in itself will clearly impact filings back to us. Um, we've also had organisations having to adapt to the impact of the pandemic. Um, to a certain extent, quite a big surprise. Certainly the extent, I, I guess, is a big surprise to many. And many control frameworks would have been targeted by fraudsters who, who always, as we know, like to jump on, uh, on new opportunities. And one example is probably the removal of face-to-face -face controls. Many organisations who previously hadn't filed much identif identity fraud were targeted in remote ways by identity fraud rings. Um, 
we've seen through recent history that during periods of economic downturn and financial hardship, uh, more opportunistic fraud mm. driven by more of a need than a want has increased. So after the, uh, take, taking the example of the financial crisis in 2008, after, after that, um, we, Cyphers was, still, was around at that time, Cyphers imported a, it, it, sorry, reported a 32% increase in fraud, filed the NFD at that time. And it's perhaps fair to suggest that we're expecting to see a rise um, once we fully come out of the back of, of the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, I already mentioned the first six months of this year and the fact that they're already showing a 13% increase on last year. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're definitely expecting that. So I suppose, going back to the question, uh, I think the pandemic has had an impact. It's clearly had an impact. Um, but I also think it's fair to say that we may not yet be explicitly aware of the full impact just yet. Yeah, excellent. And and, and you mentioned, obviously, in your presentation about, about, about the stimulus and uh, financial stimulus. And uh, in the UK, there's been uh, a number of um, schemes that offered by bank with government funding or government backing um, for businesses. And um, so, and according to your your own data, um, the as a result of you know, for, from COVID nineteen stimulus fraud and the link to companies being impersonated, you you've reported a a twenty three percent increase in that in in, in twenty twenty. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah that's Nicole's right. I think on. fraudsters um, identified the opportunity really to exploit the need and desire um, to get funds for the businesses um, and individuals as quickly as possible. So. I think like a lot of businesses were being fictitiously created in order to obtain funds, um, including those from UK business grants administered by local authorities. Um, there were definitely businesses being impersonated. Um, I think quite a few of our members have seen examples um, where car dealers, uh, where Fords were attempted to take out a government loan in the name of the company to pay for an expensive vehicle. And yeah. um, loads of impersonation attempts have been detected um, and prevented as well, actually, by typical due diligence members um, because new directors are being added and, and that's being flagged quite quickly. Um, but there was definitely pressure to release funds really quickly. So mm. where you've got pressure like that, you're, you're bound to get some losses as well. Um, we at CIFAS are one of the organisations approved by the British Business Bank to oversee fraud checks for loans being taken out as part of the BBL scheme. Yeah. Um, and we also built a system to check for duplicate applications made to the BBL scheme um, to try and sort of prevent, um, prevent fraud there as well. Um, I think official estimates at the moment say that there's up to £5 billion pounds worth of loans is at risk of not being paid. Um, but from that we're not really sure what proportion is is fraudulent at the moment yeah okay excellent so another covid19 question for you in terms of you know, has the insider threat got worse um as a result of covid19 and if, if it has and why do you think that why do you think that is has it got worse? The, the, oh, the, the threat, the threats, the threat's always there. The threat, the threat's always there. I think it's probably, probably fair to say it's evolved during a pandemic. Um, I think there's been increased opportunities to commit fraud and uh, because of businesses having to shift maybe faster than they would have liked, reduced opportunities to detect it. Um, we've touched on the shift to more remote ways of working, of doing business, um, and the fact that that shifted faster than many businesses may have been ready for certainly them would have anticipated having to be ready for um so again i think we're probably yet to see the full impact over the course of the of the pandemic due to the complexities in the detection and investigation techniques that um, members our members are having to um, to work around um if i draw on some some fraud training that, that, that most people in this industry will, 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 um, will relate to the Cressy fraud triangle. So opportunity, pressure, or motivation, perhaps yeah. rationalization or justification. There's probably never been more apt than, than now at this moment in time, or certainly during these last 18 months. Yeah. So the opportunities increased, 
uh, many of the building security physical controls are in place and the, op and the office have gone because um, we're all working from home perhaps as well working from home is a um, perhaps a sense of reduced oversight um, perhaps different businesses have dealt with that better than others um, on the motivation side um, periods of uncertainty perhaps traditionally in, in, increase in individuals motiv motivation to commit fraud so there were plenty of job losses um, mm -hmm. and even when businesses were able to make use of the furlough scheme which paid 80% of wages if those businesses chose or chose chose not to top that up or were unable to top that up um, then colleagues are still losing a fifth of their income in that mm -hmm. time so that that extra 20% could be the motivation that's required. Yeah. Um, final part of the triangle, the rationalization or the justification. I think many people would would feel more comfortable rationalizing, um, committing fraud during this time, feeling that life was unfair, feeling that their employment, employers should be paying them the additional wage, not just the furlough, feeling that their employers shouldn't pay them a, a wage at all, and just generally feeling the pressures pressures of life in the moment um so i think the threat the threat is always there and i think there's probably more opportunities or evolved opportunities to to take uh, take action on that definitely that's, that's excellent thank you um going on now to um facility um takeover um, according to your reports again your data account facility takeovers increased by 21 percent in 2020 what has been driving this increase so yeah we had over 38,000 instances of facility takeover fraud recorded in 2020 um, and as you've rightly mentioned that was a 21 percent increase on 2019 um, and so far um, looking at the first half the first six months of 2021 we've seen a further 14 percent increase on that so it looks like that trend is, is here to stay for this year as well um, I think there's a variety of reasons for that and um, there was definitely an increase in phishing and smishing and phishing attacks during the pandemic um, in the UK a lot of people will have had DPD or raw mail text yeah. um, you know and received those um, and they were they were not genuine um, I think there's been more posts on social media um, and on the surface web not just the dark web selling personal data um, or data dumps including banking logins compromised accounts and full identity profiles that are regularly identified by our intel team both on the surface web and the dark web um, I think there's like some large-scale criminal forums as well um, with thousands of members offering subscription-based products um, like personalized social engineering scripts and, and recordings and that that helps aid the fraudsters as well um, and I think where you've got continued instances of paid adverts directing consumers to malicious websites to harvest personal information, that's that's contributed. We've all been sat at home on the internet or on our phones a lot more, just aimlessly scrolling over the past year. Um, so hopefully um, the online advertising programme will look to regulate that a little bit more to sort of try and, try and help um, with the risk. Um, and then there's definitely been an increase in victims receiving calls from security teams, whether that be from, from banks um, or other organisations saying, oh, we need access to your account, we need access to your account now, can you give me your sort code, your account number, your one-time password, um, your login details. And I just think people have been, been more vulnerable over the past year. So your guard is down a little bit more, so, so mm -hmm. it's easier almost to, to be caught out, I think. Yeah, very wise words, and um, I think we've all received those raw mail and DPD kind of um, uh, um, SMS kind of phishing attacks. So um, uh, yeah, it's uh, and it's difficult. It's difficult to kind of you know if, you, if you're a uh, um, you know um, not digital literate, it, it's easy to click on the link or ring them back. So it's uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's we've all seen it. So so I, I noticed from your presentation, Neil, that uh, we're seeing increasing high levels of, uh, of, uh, of facility takeover in the telephony channel uh, than other channels. So um, why is that, do you think? Yeah, perhaps somewhat of a surprise in, the, in this day and age that um, 
you know, a, a channel that we that we know so well, the telephone has been around much longer than than, than, the, than the more advanced channels. You know, we, we all have little devices um, in our hands or on our wrists to um, to connect to the internet. So somewhat of a surprise. But I think what what we're what we're suggesting is that um, businesses that are increasingly adopting um, device intelligence um, in their online channels, so attaching a specific device or devices to a specific customer to give it mm. to give an added degree of um, certainty that they're dealing with the correct person. And so I think this means that fraudsters are having to diversify in their approach to commit facility takeover. As a result. Um, Touched on it earlier, I think there's a, there's a suggestion that criminals perceive the telephony channel as weaker. Um, I think in some instances where there's a human at the end of the phone um, managing the fraud risk rather than a computer system, which can't be swayed, a criminal may feel they'll be able to manipulate a human easier than the, than the computer may have. Um, so our, we, we say on the telephony channel, there's probably high success rates and low identity rates. You can't, you can't always pick a fraudster on the telephone. You may be able to yeah. pick online. Yeah. Um, so those wishing to can often trick contact center agencies. I think they're a big, big target for this into revealing something they shouldn't, or just to coax the agents into verifying that the fraudster is the genuine customer. And once the fraudster's um, been able to do that, in front of a uh, an employee, then they're in. They've got it. Then yeah. um, the other thing with with the telephone. So we use knowledge based authentication. Businesses use knowledge based authentication um, a lot across multi channels. But I think these ans answers can be answered um, a bit easier over the phone by fraudsters, particularly those that have done their homework. Mm. So we might give out a little too much over our social media channels at times. And fraudsters may get to know the genuine customer's life story, perhaps more than the customer themselves would know. I know if I didn't have a record of what I've done, then I probably couldn't tell you um, what I had done last week. Um, and there, there, there's definitely indicative reports out there that suggest that fraudsters will pass those sort of checks more than the genuine customer might pass them at, at, at a lot of the times. So that's really interesting that we, that we kind of forget our own security at times. Yeah, that's a very important um, topic, and uh, I've been there myself with some of the KBA kind of questions that perhaps I've I've given to a provider uh, twenty years ago or something, and uh, I've got to remember um, what my favourite um, teacher was at primary school, which is exactly. uh, is a is a historical question, I can tell you, um, and it was history. Um, right, so we've we've got an international um, audience. So, um, does the UK fraud experience echo? What is being seen around the world? Do, 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 do you have that kind of awareness of uh, we're seeing similar levels, similar types of fraud uh, internationally? I think it's quite difficult for us to answer that question um, because we we only record um, fraud um, within the UK. Um, and CIFAS itself is quite a unique organisation in that there's not many other countries whose data protection laws allow for the sharing information in the same way that we do. Um, but there are some similar schemes to CIFAS um, that exist in other countries, um, such as South Africa and the Netherlands. Um, and we at CIFAS um, are always willing to help in the inception of such schemes. Um, we've spoken to a couple of other countries as well um, about potentially setting something up. Um, I think there will definitely be crossovers um, around the world in the types of fraud that are, that are being seen, especially in the digital age. Um, you know, over half of the records on our national fraud database um, are for identity fraud. And, and I think that would be quite yeah. a similar worldwide, to be honest. Yeah, I think I can concur as, a, as an analyst who does operate internationally and, and covers, you know, kind of security and fraud. I think it uh, it, it is the similar types of fraud are happening, um, you know, especially with something, a global event like COVID has uh, meant that, uh, a lot of these, you know, type of fraud, vaccination certificate fraud, etc., and, uh, and test test result fraud is it's going to be echoed around the world. So, thank you for that. So, kind of ending the kind of the Q and A session, um, just to kind of perhaps a, a repeat of, of you know how does uh, CIFAS help the community reduce fraud? Yeah, sure. Hopefully, hopefully we've we've gone some way to to showing that in the presentation. But I suppose a little a little summary doesn't. Um 
doesn't hurt at the end. So um, we were created back in 1988. So I, I referred to the um, financial crisis of 2008. We, we'd already been in existence for, for, for a number of years prior to that. We're not for profit organization. Um, and it was set, we were set up as a result of um, credit organisations complaining to the police that not enough was being done to stop identity fraudsters. Essentially, that's where that's where we were we were born. Since that time, when we started with seven members and a team of part time staff, we've now got, as Nicole mentioned earlier, six hundred members, over six hundred members, and, and over six hundred, sorry, <laughs> over eighty members of staff within the organisation. Um, we like to call ourselves experts from what term from our soul. So um, we, we're drawn from all, all areas of of, uh, of our members. A lot of the time, a lot of um, people that come to SciFast have come from membership. And um, so we draw from a, a, like a wealth of experience, members and law, law enforcement. Um, and in 2020, we helped our members to prevent over 1.3 billion pounds worth of fraud losses. So a staggering amount. Um, again, we've touched on our operational teams and shared best practice processes and trends across organisations. Um, examples on how best to protect yourself. We have strategic second line teams sharing advice and expertise in developing counter fraud strategies, policies, fraud risk management frameworks. So a lot of what we do is under the surface as well with our members.